How do you attract the success you want? I have a suggestion. Become an eligible receiver. How do you attract the future you want? Well, you think about it. In any situation that's challenging, who do they look for? Who do they turn to? The person that can handle it. The person that can do the job. The person that's qualified. The person that's ready. The person that's got the right attitude. The person that's going to make it better because they're in it. How do you attract the future you want? Become the kind of person who would have the future you want and all the goals you seek will be your natural byproduct. Let me repeat that. Become the kind of person who would have the future you want and all the goals you seek will be your natural byproduct. Look at this. I love this. Ah. Whatever you want, whether you want you know, education, whether you want awards, whether you want physical achievements, whether you want big audiences, cool ways to travel, motorcycle tours of, the, of uh, North America, speaking in China. You know, I've had the opportunity to do all these things. That's not to say, wow, look at me, am I cool? But to just show you that it, none of those things, none, not a single one of those things was in my consciousness when I was growing up. I didn't think I was going to be able to have a significant life. I thought I would be very ordinary. See, my dad was a telephone repairman. Mom was a housewife. My grandfather was an invalid, complete invalid, from a stroke. He couldn't move or talk for seven years before he passed away. My grandmother was there taking care of him in the front room. Dad was on the road as a telephone lineman. Uh, my baby sister, Kathy, was there. And I thought I'd grow up to be a nice person with a very un, uh, unremarkable life. And then things changed somewhere along the way. Let me walk you through what happened, okay? This is just to put it in context. When Matthew McConaughey won the Academy Award a few years ago, or a couple of years ago, he stood up there and he said, you know, when I was a kid, somebody asked me, who's your hero? And I said, it's me 10 years from now. Why? Because that guy's so much better than I am. And so about 15 years later, same person asked me, now who's your hero? And I said, it's me 10 years from now. Still? No, always. Why? Because I'll never be as good as I could be. But if I'm always seeking to be as good as that person I could be 10 years from now, then I know that I'm always on the right track. So think about the kind of person you inside really deeply, sincerely want to be. What kind of person do you want to be? Hey, Brian, how are you doing? Good to see you. Coming, coming. Yep. Three, four. Can you advance it up there? Thank you. The future you see, whatever you envision, tells you what kind of person you're going to need to be. You say, well, I'm not... See, our first goal is to decide what our first goal is. <laughs> our first job is to determine what we want. We are goal-seeking organisms, right? We are achievement-oriented. We are built to accomplish things. When we visualize what's not in existence, then our mind and the world around us start showing us ways to make it a reality. People talk about goals. Well, I'd set that goal, but I don't know how to get there. What? That's the point. They're, seriously, that's the point. You set goals before you know how to get to them so that the way to get to them reveals itself as you explore the path. You don't set goals once. You, that's a to-do. If you know how to get there, it's a to-do. Just put it on the list and do it. Okay? But if you don't know how to get it, if you don't believe it really could be possible yet, what's the operative word? Yes. Thank you. Okay, if you don't believe it's possible yet, then your next task is to figure out what you really want and get clear on that. Because then everything starts showing up. It's like when you buy a new blue Chevrolet, all of a sudden you see, good Lord, today I saw 37 blue Chevrolets. Wow, where'd they come from? They were always there. 
See, it's kind of like if you're sitting in the stands at a football game and you look at the opposite stands and you see all those thousands of people. Tell yourself, just as you look at the stands, think red. And all of a sudden, boom. And you will see hundreds and hundreds of red jackets and blazers and hats and things like that. Then think blue. And all of a sudden it shifts and you start noticing the blue highlights and then the white and then whatever you want to focus on. Whatever your mind identifies as a desirable target, all of a sudden everything else starts organizing itself in, a, in such a way to reveal that to you and the path between you and it becomes clear. The future you see for yourself tells you what traits you're going to need in order to be qualified as an eligible receiver of that future. Become the person, Ty, that you want to become, and you will get the future you desire to get. I'll show you how this fits together. Next. <laughs> I'm pushing that correct button. I'm just waiting for the reveal. Ta-da! This is something I, I developed a couple of years ago, and I've called it, for want of a better name, the causation chain, because one thing causes an effect on the neck throughout this, all right? The mindset, that's where we start. Our mindset or our attitude, whoops, I didn't mean to do that. I will go back one more time. Press down, pause, one, two, three. The mindset or attitude we start with ends up, influencing the actions we take, which over time become habits, attitude, habit, habitude, right? Okay. Our habits determine our reputation. In other words, we're known by our repeated, our continual, predictable behaviors. We are known by the ways in which we behave with other people and in certain situations. And the, those observable behaviors become our reputation. We are, we have a reputation whether we choose to have one or not. Okay. Your reputation might be, I don't even notice you because you're not doing anything remarkable or noteworthy, but that's a reputation, okay, for now. Remember the word yet, okay? Your reputation determines who's willing to open their door and offer their couch and who's not. So how do you get the connections you want? You identify the biggest, coolest people you'd love to connect with. How do you get there? Be the kind of person they'd like to hang with. What does that mean? I don't know. Figure it out. Find out who you want to connect with, what types of people, and then which individuals, actual people, and then say, okay, what traits do they admire? What qualities do they look for in other people? What would they think was cool to be with, right? How can I cultivate those qualities in me? When you do, then all of a sudden the doors open to you, and the relationships expand the size of your potential future. The relationships you have expand the potential size of your future. Now you can start at this end with mindset and say, how do I need to think so that I'll take these actions? And you've seen many examples of that throughout these presentations. How do I need to think so it changes my emotional response? How do I need to think so it changes my next identifiable action or behavior? How do I need to think differently so that I end up taking the actions that if I repeat them become habits which transform me and that reputation gets seen by others that I would like to impress and they start opening their doors and saying, I'll give you a shot. What do you got? Right? And then that relationship blossoms into a bigger future than you ever imagined for yourself. So I was in Little Rock, Arkansas in 1972. I was working at the Little Rock Housing Authority, the Urban Renewal Agency. I was a government clerk. I, I was called an assistant loan specialist because I was an assistant to Bob Moore, the loan specialist. Problem was, Bob Moore didn't need an assistant. So I had nothing to do, government worker. <laughs> and I'm sitting there, bored to tears, twiddling my thumbs, reading books on urban renewal. Found out that's not the path I wanted. Uh, read other books. Read the Bible cover to cover at work in three months. <laughs> cover to cover at work in three months. Unbelievable. Talk about a, a meaningless job, right? So I'm sitting there 
Bob Moore's never saying, hey, Jim, I need your help. And so I'm just filling my time. And what happened was as time evolved, let's go to the next slide. Thank you. You start thinking about how much of yourself are you applying and what kind of habits do you need to have the future you want? Well, as things evolve, I'm sitting there at this housing authority job and in the next room, there's a radio station and it's playing his voice the voice of Earl Nightingale, the Dean of Personal Motivation, who Dennis Waitley talked about yesterday. And Dennis and I have been good friends since the mid-1970s. We did a speaking tour together. And Nightingale Conard had just released his album, and I was so envious and uh, so happy for him. But boy, I thought, that's what I want for me. Okay? So in the next room, I hear Earl Nightingale. And can you play that audio? I'll, I'll let you hear what I heard in 1972, the exact words. You know, it's not it. professional in the world. There you go. It's playing there, but we're getting music along with it. I can tell you what he said. Let's skip the audio. Thank you. What he said was, if you will spend one hour a day extra studying your chosen field, in five years or less, you'll be a national expert in that field. Let's, let's eliminate. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, if you can play it, yeah. In order to become a professional in the world of amateurs, we need to study three important subjects. One, our company and the industry in which it operates. Two, our job and perhaps the next step upward in our career. And three, we need to study people since successfully serving and getting along with people will determine our success or failure. And it can be accomplished in an hour a day, devoted to reading and making permanent notes. Studying one book or one article at a time, an hour each day, will lead to your becoming an expert at your particular job and industry in five years or less. When I heard that, it hit me like an oncoming train because that rearranged my whole belief system. I thought, wait a minute. An hour a day, okay, let's do the math. An hour a day, five days a week, 50 weeks a year, that's 1,250 hours on one subject. Even I, insignificant me, with no college degree, with no money in the bank, with no, no mentors, no special breaks, even I, C-plus student, I could do that. Heck, I'm a government clerk. I got eight hours a day. I could, I could do this by Thursday. <laughs> and I started thinking, what do I want to do? What do I, you know, I didn't have a goal. So, you know, the future you see defines the person you'll be. I didn't see a particular future. So I kept thinking, what do I want to do? What do I want to do? I don't know. And then it hit me a few weeks later. I want to do what that guy does. Now here I, I weighed 200 pounds. This is 150. I, I weighed 200 pounds. I smoked two packs of cigarettes a day. I had never been an athlete. Uh, so I was overweight, out of shape, broke, newly married, had a government clerk's job making $525 a month, did not believe I was capable of being a significant person, just thought I'd be kind of an ordinary nice guy and have a decent life and die at the statistical average age for my gene pool, right? That's what I thought. And then Nightingale says this, and I start doing the math, and I start thinking, okay, you know what I really want to do? What he's doing. I want to be an expert in the field of personal growth. I don't know anything about that, though. And I got two qualities that would tend to limit one's speaking career. I never gave a speech, and I have nothing to say. <laughs> I better get busy. <laughs> and I started thinking, well, I'm going to do what he said, except I think I'm further behind than most, so I'm going to spend two hours a day. I'm going to spend entire weekends focused on learning about personal development. So I got records. Those are large CDs with little holes in them. And I listened to those. I got tapes, audio cassettes. That's like little ribbons in a box. And I listened to those. I started getting books. And there weren't many self-improvement books back in the uh, mid-1970s. 
This was 1972 when it started for me. And so you couldn't find many books on personal development, but I found the classics, Think and Grow Rich, The Power of Positive Thinking, Success Through a Positive Mental Attitude, things like that. Uh, the Greatest Salesman in the World by Og Mendino. All of those authors later became my good friends, all of them except for Napoleon Hill, who was gone. But the guy who managed Napoleon Hill for a while, W. Clement Stone, the author of the book, Success Through a Positive Mental Attitude, I shared the platform with him twice. I was in his office, and I served on a committee with him. Og Mandino and I became good friends. I, I was in his home. He was in mine. Wow. But let me tell you how I got there. I'm sitting there wondering how in the world I can become skilled in the field of personal development, and I decided to become an absolute raving fanatic about personal development for five years. Not for 30 days, not for 41 days, for five years. Every day I was doing something like listening to recordings from Earl Nightingale, which I found on tape. Every day I was doing something like reading an article in a newly published magazine called Success Unlimited, which was the precursor to Success Magazine. Um, every day I was finding someone else who was into the field of personal development, self-improvement, and I found that my circle of friends changed. The people I'd been hanging out with kind of drifted away because I was way too fanatical for them. We were still friends, but didn't hang out anymore. And those who were into it, we connected and I started getting reinforced in all of these things I was doing. Next thing I know, I'm selling motivational tapes by Earl Nightingale door to door to businesses in Little Rock, Arkansas. I'm leading little seminars, teaching other people's methods, getting licensed to do this person's model and that person's model. I did that more and more and more. First, I did it 400 times for no money. Pause. What did I just say? 400 times I did presentations for nothing to JC's chapters, to, you know, the civic clubs, to church groups, to anybody who would listen. And I did 400 meetings in two years after work for no pay. That's fanatical. Agreed? Okay. That's textbook fanatical. And by the end of that two years, I almost knew what I was talking about. And the more I learned about it, and the more I studied books on psychology, and books on leadership, and communication, and time management, and goal setting, and strategic planning, and things like that, all of which converge in the field of personal growth, the more I studied that, the more my life was transforming. And my wife started encouraging me instead of worrying about me. You know, because at first she's thinking, gee, Jim's gone weird on me. I don't know this guy. What's he going to be? You know, and then she, after a while, starts thinking, don't stop. I like this so much better than the earlier version of you. Don't stop, right? So this went on and on. And let me fast forward and just skip to a couple of points for you. In 1984, I had been a speaker for... Uh, about five or six years, I'd met Dr. Tony Alessandro, a man who lived in San Diego, California. I was in, I had moved from Little Rock to Tulsa, Oklahoma. So I, I met Tony at a conference here in San Diego. And I said, you know, I like what you do. You like what I do. We ought to collaborate. We became partners. And then I moved from Oklahoma to San Diego. Tony and I we're all in. Everything we had, we put into our partnership. Cathcart, Alessandra, and Associates. I won the toss. And uh, literally, at uh, the Harbor, Harbor House uh, restaurant down on, on the ocean part, the Embarcadero. And we built a business. And I'm sitting in my office one day in La Jolla, 1984. Phone rings. I pick it up. May I speak to Jim Cathcart? This is he. This is Earl Nightingale scared the daylights out of me. That's the guy. That's my hero I've been listening to for thousands of hours as I drive around to all these meetings back in Arkansas and I'm selling his recordings. And he's calling and he said my name. And he said, may I speak to Jim Cathcart? And I said, uh, <laughs> which means this is he, how may I help you? And uh, he said, Mr. Cathcart, I just read an article of yours 
on, in, in uh, Nonprofit World Report, and it's on personality types. And I like that. I think it would make a good audio album. And I said, well, sir, it is an audio album. We've recorded that. He said, well, I sell those. I said, oh, believe me, I know. <laughs> he said, well, send me your album. If we like it, we'll publish it. And, uh, you know, then you can be one of our authors. I said, cool. Send it to him. He said, if you'll re-record it according to our specifications, we're in. Tony and I went into Studio C with Scott Higby right here in San Diego. We re-recorded the album, sent it to Nightingale Conant. And between 1984 and 1986, they sold three and a half million dollars worth of relationship strategies. So in 1974 in Little Rock, Arkansas, I was selling Earl Nightingale's tapes. And in 1984, he was selling mine. What an honor. Wow. Now, how did that happen? I was a clerk at the housing authority, for heaven's sakes. But what happened was I identified the future I wanted, and I started seeing the qualities I needed that I didn't yet possess. Yet possess. And I started working on me. I started getting in good physical shape, which took a long time. I lost 52 pounds. I, got, I became a runner and an athlete, and, and uh, I'm still doing that today. As a matter of fact, I do mountain trail running with a group of people up in Thousand Oaks three times a week, and I'm 69 years old. So, you know, it's working for now. And uh, I started taking every aspect of my life, mental, physical, family, social, spiritual, career, financial, emotional, and focusing on each one for a little while until I got a grasp, a grasp on it. And then I'd move to the next one and the next one. So I didn't try to balance my life with one-eighth on each or 100% spread chaotically. I would take one at a time and work on it and make sure I didn't neglect the others in the process. And I became a better husband and father. I became a better friend. I became a better money manager. I became a better salesperson. I became a better communicator. I went through all the various steps. And as they say... Seek ye first the kingdom and all the rest will be added unto you. Well, I was seeking the goal, the kingdom that I wanted. And I've had the privilege all along that way of now achieving far more than I ever dreamed. Not only that I could achieve, but that most people in my field could achieve. I've been the president of the National Speakers Association. I've been inducted into the Speaker Hall of Fame. I've received the Golden Gavel Award from Toastmasters International. Um, by the way, how many Toastmasters do we have in the room? Any? Woo! Wow, look at that. I'm going to tell you something. We have, I don't see it right here, but we have, yeah, would you bring that up, please? I brought about $6,500 worth of these. Everyone here gets one. Woo! Including, yeah! including the other speakers and the crew, okay? This is a DVD of the speech I gave to 1,500 Toastmasters at Toastmasters International in the year 2001. I was the millennium recipient of the Golden Gavel Award, which had previously been given to Earl Nightingale, Zig Ziglar, et cetera, you know. So all my heroes had received that award. And this is a full, full production DVD, so it's, you know, it's got all the features where you can go chapter by chapter, and, and um, you can really go through it like you're watching a movie. Well, anyway, you. you're welcome. You're very welcome. The reason I tell you all this is all of this is available to you. You can do these things. Every day, ask yourself, like I ask in my book, The Acorn Principle, which as Eric mentioned to you, the, pre the uh, foreword to that book was written by Dennis Waitley. Um, in the Acorn Principle, the basic daily question is this, how would the person I'd like to be do the things I'm about to do? How would the me 10 years from now do the things I'm about to do? How would the person that I would admire if I was looking in a mirror and I thought, darn, I'm proud of you. How would that person do what I'm going to be doing next. And whether what you're going to be doing next is filling up your car or helping a friend move or going on a job interview or making a sales call or organizing your day or saying I'm sorry to somebody that you were really out of line and dealing with or whatever it happens to be, 
How would that person do what I'm about to do? You ask that question every day, and the future you see is the person you'll be.